Do you know someone feeling inadequate and frustrated? Or someone who is suffering from a serious personal crisis or mental illness, such as divorce or depression? What advice would you give them? Perhaps you might say the words that form the title of this bite-sized book, maybe you should talk to someone. And that someone in this case, would be a therapist. In this bite-sized book, the author, Lori Gottlieb examines the truths and lies we tell ourselves and others as we teeter on the tightrope between love and desire, meaning and mortality, guilt and redemption, terror and courage, hope, and change. Lori Gottlieb is a best-selling American author and famous psychotherapist who has written for several publications including the New York Times, Slate, L, etc. She is most famous for her weekly Dear Therapist advice column for The Atlantic, where she is also a contributing editor. The book. Maybe you should talk to someone. Has been acquired by ABC to be developed into a series. Everyone needs to talk to someone. One moment. Lori Gottlieb is a therapist who helps patients in her Los Angeles office, in another, she's the patient on the couch breaking down in tears and coming to terms with loss in her therapist's office. Her quirky but seasoned therapist holds up a mirror that reveals to Lori, and us as readers, the game of emotional hide-and-seek we all play with ourselves and others, the pain and joy of opening our minds and hearts, and the terror and longing we feel to let our unvarnished selves step out from behind the curtain. With startling wisdom and humor, Gottlieb invites us into her world as both clinician and patient. She paints a vivid picture and draws you to become attached to her patients as she grows to love and accept them, and as they eventually grow to love and accept themselves. Therapists are humans too, it's their very humanity and the intricacies of the life they live that influences their work. The therapist, Lori, introduces us to John, a self-absorbed Hollywood writer, and producer. Lori seems to be experiencing difficulty connecting to this client John, who she frankly thinks is an asshole. The 40-year-old client, who comes off as thoroughly self, involved and uncaring about others, reports a feeling stressed out and states that he is having difficulty sleeping and getting along with his wife. He expresses annoyance with others and seeks help managing the idiots. John refers to everyone he can't understand or get along with like an idiot, everyone from his co-worker, dental hygienist down to his previous therapist, who only lasted three sessions. Lori's supervisor once told her there's something likable about everyone, and while she might have to hit reset by repeating the mantra have compassion several times in her mind, she tries to find likable traits in John. During this therapy session, as she's mulling this over, Lori comes to eerie self-realization. They both dealt with their pain by covering it up. As she listens to John rant about the world is filled with idiots and blame everyone else for mistakes, John's need to blame everyone else except himself and his refusal to take responsibility resonated so loudly with her. Lori understands what it's like to bathe in a self-righteous outrage, in the certainty that she is 100% right and others had terribly wronged her. A therapist often holds up a mirror to their patients, but also patients will hold up a mirror to their therapists. Therapy is far from one-sided, it happens in a parallel process, both the therapist and the patient benefit from it. What John doesn't realize as he's rambling on is that Lisa is reeling from a breakup she thought was going to end in marriage. Her boyfriend had unexpectedly called it quits the previous night, and that day, Lisa is trying hard to focus on her patients, only allowing herself moments to cry in the 10-minute break between sessions. Therapists also deal with the daily challenges of life, just like everyone else. This familiarity of life is what forges the root of the connection a therapist makes with strangers who share their intimate details with them. Their training might have provided tools, theories, and techniques, but living beneath their hard-earned expertise is the fact that they know just how hard being a person is. A lesser-known fact is that therapists are required to see other therapists as part of their training. They go to experience firsthand what their clients face when in a session. Even when licensed, some still see therapists. A majority of therapists find themselves sitting on somebody else's couch several times at various points during their career. This helps to have an emotional unburdening, partly due to work and partly because they're humans too, dealing with life. People often believe that their problems are caused by external forces that are beyond their control. So, they don't bother to put in the work to change their behavior because they think even if they decide to do things differently, won't the rest of the world still be the same? That may seem like a sound argument, but it's not how life works generally. Yes, 
The world is filled with difficult people, or idiots as John would have it, but we often forget that, more often than not, we are the difficult people we tend to complain about. Sometimes, we're the cause of our difficulty, and until we step into the perspective of others, we would not see it. Feeling the toll of going through the day, her private troubles and the emotional impact of hearing different traumatic delicate stories weigh on her, Lori decides to seek help and start seeing a certain Dr. Wendell, his name is changed, another therapist a mile away. Always treasure the resistance, they signal where a therapist needs to pay attention to. There's a nuance to calling patients on their bullshit. Do it too fast, and you might risk it all and lose them. Do it too slow, and they start feeling unsafe, like parents whose children refuse to hold them accountable. John and Lori are in their fourth session, it is discovered that one of John's defenses is his cell phone. Lori decides to draw his attention to her feeling dismissed when he texts during the session. If they were going to work together and make any form of progress at all, he'd have to stop using his cell phone during sessions. Surprisingly, he concedes, and through the remainder of the session, we find out that he does have a capacity to love beneath all his quills. When people come to therapy, they present an in-the-moment snapshot of themselves. It is up to the therapist to cajole, nudge, talk, listen, and guide patients to bring other aspects of their life into view. Some snapshots are dark. Some are blurry. People don't always remember how an event or conversation went, but what they don't forget is how it made them feel. Lori remembers something her supervisor always told her, always treasure the resistance. John, getting antsy with the direction of her questions, leads to his slips about Gabe. Gabe is his son, who died in a car accident at a young age, he was sitting in the back of the driver's seat, the direct point of impact. Most people want relief when they come for their first session with their therapist, so they begin their stories with their presenting problem. In her first therapy session with Wendell, Lori presents her problem as the fact that she's finding it hard to get over her abrupt breakup from her ex-boyfriend. She refers to him as the boyfriend to protect his identity. The boyfriend, who Lori describes as the sweetest guy she has ever met, broke up with her seemingly out of the blue after a two-year-long relationship. Because of how abruptly and blindsiding the breakup was, Lori feels like she never knew him. The boyfriend was the kind of guy who'd drive down to the pharmacy at 2 a.m. to get her the antibiotics she needed urgently without complaints. He was the kind that'd leave awesome post-it notes on her desk, hold her hand, open doors, and never complain about being dragged to her family events. He would send her Amazon packages full of books, because he knew books were her love language, for no reason, and he seemed to adore her family members genuinely. Lori noticed that the boyfriend was unusually quiet as they settled in to pick a movie. So naturally, she asked him if something was wrong. This is where he dropped the bomb, he has decided he doesn't want to spend the next 10 years with a child under his roof. The boyfriend revealed that he primarily had no plans to date anyone with kids, but he fell in love with her and got confused. One mistake clients often make is that they present ideal scenarios, convinced they could only be happy with that exact situation. We certainly have our deal breakers but when we go through life picking and choosing like that, we lose out on lots of good things, thereby depriving ourselves of joy. The presenting problem is often not the real issue, but merely the beginning aspect of a bigger problem. In Wendell's office, Lori relays her presenting problem by trying to paint the boyfriend as either a sociopath or a selfish liar and she wanted her therapist to confirm her assertion. She felt life would be a lot easier if someone as qualified would back up her perception of him. However, Dr. Wendell doesn't do that, he wouldn't admit that the boyfriend was a sociopath. He just listened and listened, picking up cues, making lots of empathetic HMMN HMMN and tried to establish a pattern. After all, he did know that the boyfriend was the presenting problem. The only way he could reach the real problem was by listening and observing Lori very carefully. He knows what all therapists know, that the presenting problem, the issue somebody comes in with, is often just one aspect of a larger problem. And one day, he picked up on the first cue, Lori said that her life was half over. Dr. Wendell wonders maybe what Lori is grieving about isn't the relationship but something more significant. Lori gets defensive and Dr. Wendell backs off and tries to establish a therapeutic alliance. Before a therapist can break down a person's defenses, whether that defense is obsessing about another person, in this case the boyfriend, 
or pretending not to see what's in plain sight, he needs to help the patient replace the defense with something else so that he doesn't leave the person raw and exposed with no protection whatsoever. Dr. Wendell's patience pays off as they both realize that Lori's frustration over her ex-boyfriend was merely an external symptom that masked something rooted deep within Lori, her fear of death. Changing our relationship to the past is a staple of therapy. Lori, already in her late 40s, had begun experiencing a mysterious illness which none of her doctors could diagnose. The boyfriend, and the imagined future built around him, served as a kind of curtain covering this fear. His going away left Lori to face the horror alone, even though she hadn't told him about her failing health. Wendell told Lori that, with the loss of her boyfriend, she had lost more than her relationship in the present, she lost her relationship in the future as well. We tend to think that the future happens later, he went on, but we're creating it in our minds every day. When the present falls apart, so does the future we had associated with it. And having the future taken away is the mother of all plot twists. Unfortunately, if we spend the present trying to fix the past or control the future, we remain stuck in place, in perpetual regret. Lori couldn't do anything else but Google, stalk the boyfriend because she felt that her life had ended. Moreover, she felt that, due to her age, she would never find another partner to be with her. However, Wendell suggests that by Google, stalking the boyfriend, she was holding on to a future that was cancelled. She was watching her boyfriend's future unfold while she remained stuck in the past. In an attempt to break off the pattern, Lori tries something different, she Google, stalks Wendell. After all, they were all taught during training that if something isn't working, try something different. Although Lori regrets her actions after the fact, she learns a lot about Wendell, including his parents, family, upbringing and patience. In Lori's search for happiness, she learns to find meaning. During her therapy sessions with Wendell, she realized that her boyfriend was not merely a way to hide her fear of death from herself, but also a great distraction from something which had made her anxious for a while. Namely, Lori had a book deal with a publisher, to write something on the subject of happiness. She felt utterly disconnected from the topic, and every time she would sit down to write something, she felt an anxiety that struck her to her very core. Lori had received an advance for that book, and she had already spent it. But the fact that she was obliged to return the money wasn't the most frightening part. It was the fear that, in the future, she wouldn't get another deal, at least that's what her agent had told her. However, through her therapy sessions with Wendell, Lori realizes that all of this was, once again, just an elaborate distraction. The real problem was that she didn't want to write that book, she found the work meaningless and wanted to write something else. Encouraged by her therapist, she returned the advance and proceeded to start writing this book. Julie asks her therapist, Lori, to stay with her until she dies. These days, most therapists use some form of what is already known as self-disclosure, making a calculation to assess if the personal information will help the patient or not. Therapists are encouraged during their training to be truthful with their clients to establish honesty and trust between them. So, when Julie, Lori's newly wedded patient, struck with cancer, asks her if she was wearing a pajama top, Lori answered truthfully, yes, she was. Julie didn't suspect she had cancer when she felt something tender and funky in her breast. Julie thought she was pregnant. And she was indeed pregnant, but what she deemed to be a funky tender feeling turned out to be breast cancer. Young, newly married, and pregnant, with no family history of breast cancer, Julie had been struck by the randomness of the universe. While grappling with how to handle the cancer treatment and the pregnancy, she suffered a miscarriage. There's nothing like an illness to take away one's sense of control, even if we have less of it than we imagined. Julie got through her first treatment, which was brutal but projected to leave her tumor free. In six months, she'd get her final scan, to clear her to start trying for babies. The scan results that were supposed to show nothing instead revealed a different type of cancer, a rare one. In all likelihood, this was going to kill her. It might be five years, or ten if things went well. Not wanting to go through this alone, Julie asked her therapist a difficult question. Will you stay with me until I die? Lori realizes that the nature of work had gone from helping Julie come to terms with her illness, to helping her come to terms with her death. She answered, yes. In a way, 
there was no way out of it, Julie had no choice but to face the inevitable. However, how she faced it is an entirely different matter. And that's where therapy and Lori proved helpful. Over time, Julie decided that crumbling beneath the weight of the news is pretty much the same as already dying before death itself. Embracing this new kind of freedom meant living life fully to your last breath. And she did just that. Julie embraced life and began to live more. She made a bucket list, and even made Lori promise to tell her if she was taking it too far. At the top of her bucket list was starting a family, but after several miscarriages, it was discovered that her body was too weak to birth a child. She started taking risks in a way she had never done before, for the simple reason that she had nothing to lose. She decides that if she had one more year to live, she'd apply to be a weekend cashier at Trader Joe's. At the time, her husband thought she was insane because why would a person with limited time to live idealize working at the franchise? Any sane person would want to work less not more, but he didn't understand her dream. He didn't need to understand it, it wasn't his anyway. Julie switched to working cashier at Trader Joe's for the weekend, and it turned out to be a great decision at that time in her life because she craved social contact. Julie planned her funeral and permitted everyone to cry if they wanted to. She wrote to her husband a love poem titled The Shortest Longest Romance, an epic love and loss story and created a dating profile. He read both at her funeral, and it was filled with love, humor, sadness, laughter, and comfort. The depressed 70-year-old, Rita, plans to end it on her next birthday. Rita is a divorced woman whose presenting problem is depression. She expresses regret over what she believes to be bad choices and a life poorly lived. Rita reports that if her life doesn't improve in one year, she plans to end it. When Rita had come for her very first session at the beginning of spring, she was so depressed that when she gave an account of her situation, it was as if she was reading an obituary. The final line had been written, and her life, she believed, was a tragedy. Thrice divorced and the mother of four troubled adults, due to her lousy mothering, she explained, grandchildless and living alone, retired from a job she disliked, Rita saw no reason to get up in the morning. Her list of mistakes was long, choosing the wrong husbands, failing to put her children's needs above her own, not protecting them from their alcoholic father, not using her skills as an artist in a professionally fulfilling way, and not making an effort when she was younger to form a community. It's no surprise her kids hate her. She had numbed herself with denial for as long as that worked. Recently, however, it had lost its efficacy, even painting, the one activity she enjoyed and excelled at, barely held her interest. Now, her 70th birthday was coming up, and she had struck a deal with herself to make her life better by then or stop living it. Lori deduces Rita was going to wait the whole year, before doing anything drastic because she wanted change, not death, as it was, she already felt dead inside. When Lori gives suggestions to inject vitality into Rita's life, she shoots down every single one and shares a story of the Hello family. There's a small family of four that moved into the apartment opposite Rita's about a year ago. The husband works from home and plays with the kids in the courtyard. And every day when the mother comes in from work, without fail, she calls out hello, family. And do you know what I do? Rita asks Lori in tears, I know it's ungenerous, but I seethe with anger. Because there's never been a hello, family. For her. Rita writes a letter to a former friend revealing details of the past as the reason they can't be together. Rita called for an emergency session, and she came in agitated and uncharacteristically disheveled. There had been a man in her life named Myron. Myron is a former friend who she met at the mailbox. At the time of their friendship which ended six months ago, he was her only friend, and he asked her to go to the farmer's market with him. Rita thought it was a date, so she dramatically declined and they soon became fast friends. They had similar interests and even though they weren't dating, they spent much of their time together. And while Rita at first found Myron merely decent looking, she had trouble finding men over 50 attractive, one day, as he was showing Rita photos of his grandchildren, something in her stirred. At first, she thought it was the envy of his close relationship with his family, but she couldn't deny that she was also feeling something else. It surfaced more and more, though she tried not to talk about it. After all, 
she knew from their first mortifying encounter by the mailboxes that her relationship with Myron was merely platonic. However, months into their platonic relationship, it began to feel more and more like they were already dating just without the official terms. Rita realized she had to ask him about it, say something to him about the direction of their relationship, but along the way, she lost the nerve until it was too late and Myron had started dating a woman he met on Tinder, Randy, who was much younger than Rita, in her fifties. Rita felt gutted, and that was why she had decided to kill herself at 70 if she didn't feel better. Myron broke up with Randy three months later and professed his undying love to Rita at the car park of the exercise place they both shared. Myron confesses to missing her and kissed her, which led a confused Rita to slap him and run off to make the emergency session. Rita decides to come clean to Myron about her past so that he can make informed decisions on whether he still wants to be with her when he finds what kind of monster she was. She details in the letter, which she read out loud to Lori amidst tears, her lonely childhood, her struggles with depression, and how it affected her children. She also talks about her abusive first husband, how being a neglectful mother, coupled with her husband's addiction to alcohol, messed up her children, making them want nothing to do with her. She went further to say that she had lied about playing bridge cause if they had to travel to one of the towns her children lived, he'd become suspicious when she doesn't visit them. So that's me, Myron, she ends the letter to Myron. That's the person you kissed in the parking lot. Charlotte, the alcoholic in denial about her addiction. Charlotte reports that she drinks a couple of glasses of wine nightly to relax. It turns out, Charlotte edited that part of her life and displayed an interesting snapshot to Lori. When Charlotte entered treatment for anxiety and depression, she was in denial about her addiction to alcohol. She drank more than a few glasses and had started having gaps in her memory due to getting drunk. She didn't believe there was anything wrong with social drinking, and she worried that her real addiction was Lori. Charlotte hated having to rely on Lori as much as she relied on her parents. Charlotte dates unavailable men, unwittingly drawn to men who replicate some of her daddy's unavailability traits when she was young. Her parents were unavailable a lot while raising her. They fought a lot cursing and yelling so loudly that the neighbors sometimes complained. They were unattentive, and because of this childhood experience, Charlotte came to unconsciously associate love with a sense of anxiety, rather than happiness or tranquility. It was an emotional roller coaster while growing up, which in turn influenced her life and decisions. The termination of therapy doesn't signal the end, but a pause in a conversation that carries on as long as you live. Gradually, through his sessions, John learns to acknowledge his grief, be more empathetic, and communicate better with his wife. They begin a healing journey together, coming to terms with their son's death as a couple. Rita also begins the journey to forgiveness and healing, finally freeing herself from her self-imprisonment. In a way, it was the therapy sessions themselves that did the trick, Rita needed someone to talk to. She had been isolated for a decade, coming to the point of splurging on pedicures just so that she could feel some human touch. Myron received Rita's letter, and after taking some time off to absorb what Rita had just revealed, seeking counsel from his brother, late wife and himself, he decided to take a chance on Rita. Although Rita still falls back into her old self, destructive patterns, she's better equipped now. With Lori's help, Rita can efficiently identify them and adequately manage them, and slowly, she inserts herself back into society. Rita starts teaching art, which she's passionate about, at a local college, opens a website to sell her art, forms a bond with a hello family neighbors, the small kids call her their California grandma, and she starts off the process of repairing the strains with her children. In fact, after reading the letters she sent off to them amidst tears, they are inspired to get their shit together. Because, in their words, if you can, we can. For Charlotte, she joins the AA for real now and stays committed to the program. She goes cold turkey on alcohol and cuts off her old friends who could encourage her old lifestyle. Lori attends Julie's funeral, keeping to her promise, and muses on how the seeming end of therapy is just a pause in the conversation. The strangest thing about therapy is that it is structured around an ending, it begins with the knowledge that the time between a therapist and their patient is finite. An end doesn't necessarily mean the end of a relationship, the way a relationship in real life doesn't end. Even when we stop seeing them, they go on to live on in our hearts. 
people grow in connection with others, and all four patients, including Lori, are proof of that. Conclusion we discover that the presenting problem is often a preemptive veil to the real problem, and we rationalize too much as humans to the point where we blind ourselves to the truth of our problems. Underlying issues often involve a fear of death, isolation and or meaninglessness, which is usually coupled with a lack of a sense of freedom. This bite-sized book reveals how some people climbed their way out of hiding, overcame self-defeating habits, and woke up to their own strength through the struggle and miracle of human connection. If they could, you can too. What you should strive for is meaning not happiness, we get nothing out of meaningless things. It is only when we find some meaning that we can fight through things.